So to paraphrase David Bradford, he's one of the co-authors of a book called Influencing Up. He says that those of higher levels tend to go deaf and those at lower levels tend to develop laryngitis. So I believe that these afflictions can be cured. Well, that is what we're going to explore in managing up, developing effective relationships at all levels, which I like to affectionately call bossing the boss, right? But they like this topic better, that, talk, that uh, title better, right? <laughs> so by the time that you leave this afternoon, I trust we're going to have busted assumptions laying all over the floor. Do you know what that looks like? No, but no bad. <laughs> A mess, a mess. Yes, busted assumptions laying all over the floor. And you're also going to walk away with some tips and techniques and direction on how you can start to manage more effectively, start to have better boss bossing. Does that sound like what you'd like to have? All right, okay. So what is this managing up? It's actually a process. It's not just a one-time thing. It's not what you do once a year. It's a process, a continuous process. And it's not just with internal people and not just people on your project, but at all levels within your organization. And what sometimes people forget is also outside your organization. Did you ever think about managing executives and managers with your vendors, with other companies that you work with? Hmm. Or are you doing it so unconsciously and you're so competent you don't even have to think about it anymore? Now you're thinking about it, all right? So there's actually, so you want to make sure that you're taking into consideration one yourself, one them, and the other is the organization. So you've got a lot of triangles in project management, right? Your constraints, <laughs> your talent. <laughs> and then we have another triangle for you, and this is for managing up. Making sure that, you know, you can't just do one, because if you just focus on yourself, then what's going to happen to the boss and the organization? If you just focus on the organization, what's going to happen to you and the boss, and vice versa, all the way around that triangle. So how many of you have heard of, watch TED Talks, or own the book Start With Why by Simon Sinek? Start with why. All right, and that's what I would like to start with right now, is why. I gave this presentation to the project management group in Clear Lake Galveston, and one of the guys in my session was like, well, why? <laughs> like, why do I need to do this? Why do we even care about this? What does this matter? Well, we only had one why in the room, but that's a good question. Why would you need to do this? It sounds like a lot of work. And that's where the busted assumptions are going to be all over the floor when we go, right? You think it's a lot of work. But why might you want to do that? I propose there's two big reasons, and I found that for myself, is one, enjoy my work more. Things can be easier if you do that. It might take a little extra effort in the beginning, but it's going to be easier in the long run. So one day I'm sitting in an office in a meeting, right, with a re-engineering group. I worked in the power industry and oil and gas. And we're re-engineering, and we got this question about something going on with the project. And we start to debate about it. And people start talking about what would David, the vice president, think or want or do. And I'm sitting here going, because I'm a new engineer, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Naive, don't know, you're not supposed to talk to executives. Why don't we just go ask David? He's right down the hall. And they're like, you can't ask David. Oh my God, I'll go, well, why not? But there's got to be a few people in the room that were comfortable going down the hall and talking to David, and someone eventually did. I didn't mind because I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. So that can make your life easier because you can sit around and wonder about things, but why don't we just go talk to them and ask them? Or maybe you don't even have to go talk to them because you already know. And the other part of it is, has to do with opportunities. Because they knew about me, one of the executives, when deregulation came through for the power industry in the late 90s, they invited me to help the accountants. Because even though I'm an engineer, I'm kind of crazy and creative, and help the accountants put together a training class on profit centers and profit and loss. Because that's not how the power industry operated before it was cost plus a certain rate of return. So I got the opportunity to work with the accountants on a training class. I came up with a game where everybody owns a power plant. They roll dice, they make decisions, stuff happens, and they see the effects on their bottom line. So that was a cool project. I got invited to do a lot of other different projects because they knew about me. What about their legacies? Do you know what their legacy is? Do you know what they want to leave behind when they go? I found out later that one of the executives, because I joined the power industry when I was the only female engineer in my whole department of 2000. 
I was from Michigan. I had a crazy accent. So I was like an animal in a zoo. Everybody wanted to come and see the little female engineer with the funny accent. <laughs> okay? But uh, it, it's just, if you can figure out your why, there's a lot of opportunities. And if you know what someone's legacy is to make, to put in place the first female vice president in the company, well, that would have been good information to know. All right? So you could work with that. So I want you to think about for a minute, why is this important to you? What is your why for even coming in this afternoon, besides you heard music and heard there were prizes? <laughs> but what was your why for coming in to listen to this? Are you struggling with something? Have you not developed relationships before? When I was a young engineer, I didn't know that that was what we were supposed to do or that would be a good idea. Things just happen naturally. So I want you to think about what your why is. So when I work with clients, when we're coaching, when I'm speaking, when I'm training, there's always a here's where you are, here's where we want you to be, and through coaching or training or motivation or chocolate or something, we're going to get you <laughs> to the place that you want to be. And I, I wrote a book, I call that from SOS, which some of you um, are mistaken about what that stands for. It stands for same old stuff. And well on the way is wow, where you want to be well on the way, we're always moving. So I like to use pictures to illustrate these places of where you are and where you want to be. I'd like you all to take out your right hand, please, and bring your thumb and your index finger together. Some of you have done this before. Maybe not. Now I'd like you to bring your hand to your chin. Please bring your hand to your chin. <laughs> bring your hand to your chin, y'all. Your chin is at the bottom of your face. <laughs> I saw a face back there go, I, I sat there like this. They said it three times. I go, my hand's on my chin. Why do you keep saying this? Leave me alone. <laughs> but all that means to me is you're very visual, so the fact that we're going to use pictures next is probably a really good idea, right? <laughs> because if I said it, it's just going whoop. But if I show you a picture, you're going, yeah, I got it. If you have a handout, yeah, you got it. If there's a PowerPoint, ooh, you can see it. So what I did up here is I gave you two pictures that represent my SOS and my wow in reference to managing up. Bossing my bosses. Now, I have my own company, so I'm my own boss. And my husband will tell you how difficult I am. <laughs> okay, but I also work in a corporation. I'm a fitness instructor, teach indoor cycle and yoga and weightlifting. So in that organization, it's a totem pole. I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. I'm a group exercise instructor. That's the bottom of the totem pole. And whenever I have an idea, i got to tell my group exercise manager, and then i got to tell the club manager, and then it goes up all the way to the CEO. So that's how my managing up is right now. That's how it's supposed to go. But how I want it to be is like a big box of chocolates, where we're all in this together. We all, we're all different flavors, you know. We've got all different insides and outsides and skills and talents. We can all talk to each other, share ideas, and get some things done. That's how I'd like it to be. Now, I've actually turned this into that because I just write and talk to the CEO. I send him a package or a letter or look on the board of directors, see who's in charge of certain things. That's how I get to the top of organizations. If you'd like some tips on that, we can talk after. It works all the time. <laughs> okay? But that's my SOS and my wow. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is to come up with your SOS and wow. Where are you right now with managing up? And where would you like it to be? Where would you like things to be? I've got some pictures I'm going to pass around. Or you can draw your own picture. Or you can just write a description if that's the way that you operate. But I want you to pick a picture of how things are now, a picture of how you'd like things to be. So your same old stuff now and your wow of managing up how you'd like those relationships to look. So how are we going to get you there? How are we going to get you from this same old stuff to wow? We're going to move you pretty far along the way, or at least thinking about what you can do before you go. And this is the way we're going to do it. We're looking at assumptions first, because I told you we've got to bust them and leave them on the floor. And that's what I find is the biggest obstacle for most people is what they're thinking, right? Partnering, trust, strengths and weaknesses, work style, expectations. We're all looking at these different things about each other and the people we want to partner with. And then we're going to examine risk taking because some of you are and some of you aren't. So if you aren't and it's difficult for you to go down the hall and walk into the office of an executive or start conversations with certain people, then we're going to look at how you can make that happen. And then the last part, um, nobody ever has any problems with that, so we're going to skip that part entirely. <laughs> right? 
No, please don't. That's what I came for, just the last one. <laughs> okay. All right, so the first part is assumptions. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I don't want you to raise your hand yet. If you don't want to reveal that about yourself, it's okay. Don't raise your hand at all. And I'm going to ask a question. I want you to look around the room and see if you can pick out the people that this would be true for. All right? So the first question is, how many of you are beer drinkers or like beer? So I want you to look around the room. Don't raise your hand yet. Look around the room. See if you can pick out the beer drinkers. All right. If you like beer or a beer drinker, raise your hand proudly and look around the room, see if you were right. Were you right? <laughs> hey. All right. How many of you can drive a manual, a stick shift? Don't raise your hand yet. Don't raise your hand yet. Maybe we should have more of those in Texas with the trucks. Look around the room, see if you can pick out the people that can handle a stick shift. If you can, raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> Holy smokes. Are you serious? Woo! I'm excited. That's awesome. Did you expect the whole room to raise their... No, no. You didn't get that one right. I didn't get that one right either. How many of you are sporting a tattoo? Don't, look, don't raise your hand yet. How many of you are sporting a tattoo? <laughs> look around the room. See if you can pick out the tattooed people. Do you don't... <laughs> If you have a tattoo and you'd like to share that you do, please raise your hand, but don't show us in case it's... <laughs> you know? Oh, see, that surprised me. I thought there'd be more of those. All right. How many of you, this is Texas, if I brought a quarter horse in here, could actually saddle that baby up, get, mount that horse, get that horse to do something on purpose, not because you're knowing what you're doing, loping, galloping, turning circles, look around, look for the cowboys and the cowgirls. If you, all right, if you're a cowboy or a cowgirl, could do that, raise your hand. This is Texas. Come on. All right. All right, y'all. Last question. How many of you are or think you are good dancers? Look around the room. See if you can, <laughs> see if you, see if you can pick out the good dancers. I know I got one back there, that little guy. He can, that three-foot tall guy. If you are or think you are a good dancer, please raise your hand. If your hand is up, please stand up. <laughs> You gotta prove it. All right. Okay. So if you stood up and you actually moved a little bit, you get a prize. Where'd my bucket go? Why did I do that? I asked a bunch of questions. You were wrong about most of them, some of them. The dancing thing, why did I test you? Because you gotta test your assumptions, right? You got to check somehow. You got to find out. You got to ask some questions. You've got a lot of assumptions. Okay? So we all do this. It's called the ladder of inference. Is my bucket passing around? It's, okay. So the first thing that happens, you observe some data about somebody, right? I moved to Texas on uh, Go Texan Day, rodeo time. I came down here from Michigan. Everybody's riding horses. Oh my gosh, on the feeder roads. I didn't know about the trail riders. I thought, you, I thought you people rode horses to work. Oh, my God, I'm from Michigan. Mama. Okay. So that was observable data. And then I go to work, and everybody's wearing cowboy boots and cowboy hats and, and those string tie things. And I'm like, this is what I have to wear to work, all right? So I observed some data. This is my experience. I think this is what all of you do and all of you wear. Right? This, we do this about everything. We start to select data. Oh, that's got to be now. If you see that, you go, that's got to be a Texan. Right? We make assumptions. We start to add meaning to this. We draw conclusions. From the conclusions start come beliefs. I believe everybody that lives in Texas wears cowboy boots and rides in the trail ride before rodeo. Right? And then we start to take action based on that. Where's your boots? I thought you were a Texan. All right? So that's what happens. We flow through this. It happens at work. And you've got assumptions about managing up in your bosses and executives. They don't have time to talk to me. They don't care about me. They, they should know who I am, right? So what I want to ask you to do right now is to find a partner, or if it's easier to do just three of you together, two or three of you together at the table. You can turn and grab a little group or just next to you. You got some pink or white lined paper or some extra paper of your own. 
and we're going to get in groups of two or three, whatever's convenient, and I'm, then I'm going to tell you what to do. We're going to make the longest list. It's all the assumptions that you hold about bossing up, managing up, bossing the boss, assumptions you hold, assumptions you, pink, you think people hold, you pink people, think people hold, any assumptions that you can come up with, any stories. They don't have time, we have bad personalities, we're never gonna make we're never gonna be friends, yada yada. Whatever your assumptions are, the longest list wins on your mark, get set. Right? What else? They know it all. I don't have anything that they don't know. You know, that's one of the biggest things that coaches, new coaches have to get over is if we coach executives. We're not telling them how to do their work. We're helping them figure out other things, right? So I'm like five, seven years ago when I was new, I'm like, oh, I'm not afraid of them now, right? So, that they don't like conflict. I love that, right? If you don't know, you didn't know that about me. Now we know. So there's a lot of assumptions, and I want you to pick the, your favorite one. Maybe it isn't even yours. Maybe it's somebody else's on the list, right? But pick that one and think about, if that wasn't true, how would I be acting instead? If that wasn't true, if they really did have time, if they really did want to care, if they really don't know everything, and I know something they don't know, and they need to know this. What if that opposite of what you're assuming was true? How would you act differently? I propose you're not doing a lot of things because you believe that. And if you looked at the opposite of that, then what action would you be taking? And I trust that, what's that? You would talk to them. You would talk to them. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's a game that I use. I, I use it in uh, project management classes. I use it when I'm going to career day at schools. I've used it with children. I've used it with adults. Some of you might have played it. It's called the paper airplane game. And that's why the pink paper has folds in it, because I recycle, and it's from the paper airplane game. But what I do is you get a number of teams. Each team has a different pack of colored paper. And the goal of the, the game is to be the team with the most airplanes in the landing zone. So I'd have you guys all line up. This would be the landing zone. You got a color, you got a stack of paper on your mark, get set, go. I've done it in grade schools. The kids go freaking wild. They're wadding up paper and they're having a ball. The teacher comes by, oh no, you have to fold it. I can leave them alone, they're fine. The older they get, my project management people wanted 10 minutes to prepare their team and teach them how to fold an airplane properly. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is, you were a free spirit. You would have talked to anybody before, right? But you got stifled throughout your whole life. Some stuff happened to you, and now you believe all these things, and you're not doing that. So if the least that you can walk away with today is one of those assumptions, you think about, what if it wasn't true? What would I be doing differently? I'm going to do that, and I'm going to tell Margaret in 30 days what I did. She's going to be so excited and send me a prize. <laughs> That's what I want to happen for you the least, is just to even to start thinking about that. Will you do that? Baby says yes. All right. <laughs> Y'all are committed. All right. So let's get into this partnering, this managing up, this bossing the boss. First thing I want you to think about is who do you need to partner with? So I want you to think about right now, who are you partnering with? Who are you, man? what executive, what other people at different levels, not just on your project team, but in the corporation or outside, who are you managing or relating to, and how is that working? And then are there some people that, man, I really should start talking to this person, but it's been 10 years, and I can't start now, right? There's another assumption. So that's what I want you to think about. Is there someone that you have a kind of relationship with right now that needs to be developed a little bit more? Or is there a person you're not even talking to yet that you would need to talk to? And a lot of times when we think about executive, we think like they don't need to know any of this. They all know, they know all of this. But maybe you've got a really great idea. And a lot of times we forget about the administrative executive assistant, that that might be the person you need to partner with. Because they're the ones that hold the calendar sometimes, right, and chart. But all you have to do is talk to them and convince them that your information is worthwhile. And if they go, yeah. That's a great idea. I'm going to make sure so-and-so gives you some time for that. Okay? So that's another person we don't think about. And you can also partner with me if you're not partnering with me, right? No. But I want you to think about who you're partnering with that needs improvement and who you're not partnering with yet. 
and you would need to talk to them. Okay. I've been married this June, it'll be 34 years. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have two children, and they both uh, got married last year, like I said. We all went through premarital counseling, different churches, right? When I went through premarital counseling many years ago in the Catholic Church, you talked to the priest a couple times, and you also met with a sponsor couple. And each time you met with a sponsor couple, you went over a different topic, finance, romance, I can't remember what the other two were. So we do a questionnaire, find out my husband and I, you know, what you think about this, and then we talk to each other, and then we talk to the sponsor couple. And I remember the finance quiz was, how much money would you spend without asking your partner? And I wrote $2,000. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, that's a lot. Maybe I should write it down. I marked it down to 500. And he wrote $25 and crossed it out and marked it up to 50. So when we talked, we're like, whoa, I wouldn't ask until I spent this much. You See, he called me up after we were married, and he's talking about this software package. And I'm like, well, how much is it, hon? And he goes, $25. I go, why are you asking me, right? So it's important to have these conversations. It's almost like premarital counseling, right? Pre-project relationship counseling, whatever it is, but to sit down and find these things out about each other. Because if you know them before, it's going to be a lot easier than if you find out later after you spend so much money and they were upset about that. So that's what I want you to think about is who do you need to partner with that you're not? Who are you already partnering with? Maybe that is assistance to making, you know, talking to people that are friends of so-and-so. That would be a good thing too because they know about them. So thinking about this network, just starting to think, well, wow, you could even make a chart of all these connections. Okay? And it doesn't have to be that difficult. Just one relationship can expand. You know, some of you that are old enough to know about the, I think it was Prell commercial, they told their friend, and so on, so on. So just make one relationship, and it's just like on Facebook, right? You friend someone, oh, look at all the friends they have, let me friend all those. It just starts to expand that way, okay? So as we start to get into these relationships, the first thing, one of the things we really need to do is start to build trust. And these are the, the characteristics that I think are super important personally in trust is consistency, right? Getting to know that, yes, they, you know that when you give this to someone, certain things are going to happen. Integrity, that people say they're going to do what they do what they say they're going to do. How do they communicate, you know? and consideration for you. If they know that you have family and you need to be somewhere sometimes, but they're always coming in you know, with something at 4.45 and they know you gotta leave at five, but they don't care. So these kind of things start to build trust. When I worked in the power industry and deregulation came through, I was given a project to, to lead, it was corporate-wide, company-wide. Every department in the company I had to connect with, get people involved in this project. We were to find a model or create a model that would help us understand the new power market. And everybody uh, laughed and joked and said, good luck, Margaret, mission impossible, right? So when I made my first update to executives and managers, I thought, ooh, mission impossible. I'm going to pull out an envelope. I'm going light to a, light a fuse, play some music, <laughs> make that presentation interesting. It's mission impossible. But the first thing I did was check with my boss, told him what I was going to do, showed him the presentation, Showed him my crazy creative, and he okayed that. So he knows. He could trust me that even though I'm crazy and creative, I'm going to check on some things that, even though I don't think it's too out of the box, it might be for him. So that's where you start to develop that relationship. Stephen Covey uh, has a book, Speed of Trust, that some of you might have read. Okay? And he has character, character and competence, or he splits a lot of the trust factors under, and then some fall under both. And I'd like you to look at these and kind of think about how good are you at these different things. And also think about, are there some people that you're not developing relationships because you don't trust them? What would you need them to do to be able to trust them? So some of these conversations that we can start to have are about, you know, I really need to, you, you seem to be watching me a lot on all of my... <laughs> projects in my work and checking in on that. Is there some information? You need to check and find out why that's happening. Is there a trust issue there? Or they just like to have everything, right? So which one of these might be a biggest issue for you? Which one of these things do you need to up your game on to show other people so they can trust you? 
And we're going to go through some of these other ones, but it's really delivering, you know, doing what you say you're going to do. I think that is really important. But they can trust you more if they know you. Okay? So I gave one of the first talks to the Project Management Institute Energy Corridor. They kicked off those meetings there, and it was a, a sold out. It was on busting assumptions. Well, the executive that was sponsoring that didn't know me at all. He didn't know who Margaret Johnson was, but someone had recommended me, right? So he put all his trust in the person who recommended me, right? And then he got to know me, and he knew it was all right. I said, I'm guaranteed good time. It's going to be fine, right? But he didn't know me, but he could trust the person that recommended. So it's kind of getting to develop that network and also making sure that you're doing these things. And just pick one. You don't have to do all of them. If I said I was going to give it to him by 2 o'clock, Make sure that you do it by 10 to 2, whatever it is, but start to make sure that you're a trustworthy person, okay? Have any of you done the Now Discover Your Strengths or the Strengths Finder book? The heck? Okay. In your handouts, I've listed some of the strengths from that, and it basically says that we naturally have certain talents, things that we're really good at, okay? And that if we can find ways to utilize those things in work, then we'll be a lot happier and more effective. So if you already know those about yourself, I want you to write down one of your strengths and one of your areas you need a little help in. <laughs> and then I want you to think about that one person, one of those people that you want to partner with. What might be a strength of theirs, but where do you see them having a little bit of a weakness or maybe need a little bit of help that you could step in and help them out? So maybe they give great presentations, but they're a terrible organizer. So you could organize all the material for them. I know that um, one of my son's young friend engineers, when she first started working, she was so organized and such a detailed researcher that the executives would have her do the research and prepare the presentation and the slides, and they'd present. It's a beautiful partnership there. They don't either have time or can't do that, and they can speak, but she can organize. I even uh, asked her to help me on a trip that she'd been before because I knew she'd done all the research, right? So that's kind of a beautiful example of partnering. So I want you to think about this one person you want to start to develop a relationship with. You can observe. You started to observe some things about them at work or in anything that they've written that's gone out in the company or what other people have mentioned to you or how you've seen them operate. You can tell what a strength is about them. You might be able to see something they might need help with. I want you to think for a minute about how you might be able to partner with them with your skills and with where you see a little need in their area. When I first started working uh, after the power industry, I went into oil and gas and technical sales. And one of the executives, I was talking with him in his office, he said, Margaret, you've done this and this, and you have this and that. How can you help us? I'm like, I thought that was the coolest question I've ever been asked. Like, hey, want to write your own job description? I mean, I was doing technical sales, but he also wanted me to expand and how else could I help the company? So you don't always get them asking you that question. You could offer that. You know, here's my responsibilities, and I'm taking care of all this, but I also see a need for and have an interest in and have a strength in this, and I see how I could start to uh, change management guy. Where's my change management guy, right? I see how I could help this move, and here's the benefit it would. Would you let me uh, look into that? So looking at your strengths and your weaknesses and partnering with them, and the weaknesses don't have to necessarily be in your boss. They can be in the organization. They can be in a process. Okay. You can see other project managers that might need some help on certain things on their project that you are, um, are, are better at or things that flow better for you. You knew that when you were in school. I knew that in engineering. A lot of us would help each other on different classes and topics and things. So where could you start partnering? How about work styles and expectations? There's one of the executives I'm coaching, all right? And I, once in a while, I'm a night owl, but I don't usually stay up till four. But one night I happened to be up till four. I was writing. I was in a groove. Any of you that went to the flow session earlier today, <laughs> I was in my flow. It's four o'clock in, in the morning. I send an email off to this executive. And before I can shut my computer down, boop, there's a response back. And she's all excited. Oh, my gosh, I found another morning person. Are you going for a run? I'm ready to go for my run. And I said, no, I'm going to bed. <laughs> all right? So that's an important thing to know. 
Just a little thing like that. I mean, with my coaching clients, with the executives in your organization, are they a morning person or a night person? My team knew that I might come in late because I'd take the kids to school and I'd start at 8.30 or 9, but I was going to be there at 7. So even after they left at 3.30, there might be some messages on their phone from Margaret after hours or 2 in the morning kind of thing. So that even is just getting to know kind of their work style. How do they work? I like if I send you a text or an email, I like if you have to think about it and research, I still like a K or a got it. You know, I told one of my friends, I go, I don't know if you got it or not. I don't know if you're thinking about it. You know, I don't know. If you just give me a K, that means, okay, you got it. Or thinking, I'm like, okay, I know they're thinking about it. So I can let it go. But otherwise, I'm wondering. So if you know that about the per how much better could we work together if you just sent me Ks all the time? Yes. Okay. I don't know if you, that's the part I need, right? So little things. Sometimes you think it's a huge thing that you got to learn about them, but it doesn't have to be that big. So work styles, their expectations. You ever sit down with someone and when you say, you know, I need this as soon as possible, well, what do you mean by as soon as possible? As soon as possible for me is like I'm doing all these things and I'm teaching penguin yoga on Saturday at Moody Gardens and it's going to be next Tuesday. That's as soon as possible for me. And you're thinking as soon as possible, I need it right now in 10 minutes, all right? So expectations for your work, well, you want this type of thing, you want this report, what are you expecting? What might that look like? And checking in on those things. All of these different things, kind of what are their agendas? If you look in your handout, there's underneath the strengths, the personality styles are in there too, but there's a little list of a bunch of questions. What are their legacy? What do they want to leave behind? What pressures are they under? You know, you may think they're curt and whatever, but they may be under so much pressure they have no other way to be. So getting to know all these things by talking to them, by talking with other people, by observing, by using your emotional intelligence, these can all be... Um, very valuable techniques and ways to do that. And also their values. So another thing I'd like to add up here, do you know what they value? Do you know what's important to them? I knew money, who said money? Who said money, price to you? <laughs> and I know I owe Barry one. Because that was where my story was going. With the, when I was at Baker Energy, the CEO, you knew what he valued. He's walking up and down the aisles, the, you know, throughout the office all day. You making money? Find some ways to make us money. And money was on his mouth, his tip of his tongue all the time. So I had an idea one time, right? But they don't have time to listen to me and they don't care what I think, right? Isn't that what some of you think? I said, I just walked by him in the hall. I said, I get an idea how we can make some more money. You want to hear it? And he said, get on my schedule. Talk to my assistant. <laughs> And I got a whole hour with them. How priceless is that? Because I paid attention. How could you not, right? He's running up and down the hall saying, make money. Well, in our work, you couldn't because you first have to get in with the client and be an approved vendor and then go through the bidding process and then whatever, right? But he wants to make money today. But yeah, I just keyed in on his value and I got an hour with them. So you, they all have time for you when it's the right stuff that you want to talk about. But it's paying attention to what's important to them Keeping in that triangle of what will help you, what will help the boss, what will help the organization. Okay? You can either write this down or just keep it in your head because it's pretty short. I want you to, these four words, love, status, money, and family. And I know because all of you were here <laughs> and instead of here, right, I probably needed to write it down somewhere. But love, status, money, and family. Those four values, I'd like you to rank those, one through four, most important to least important to you. So I presented and taught a team building to some bargaining unit people at the plants, and I gave them this value exercise, and the one gentleman in the room said family, love, money, status was the order he ranked those values in. And I said, well, you know, we're deregulated now, and there's an opportunity for you up in Minnesota, I call it. <laughs> But he loves everything about Texas right here. He loves his job. His wife has a great job. The kids love their schools and their neighborhood and their friends and their buddies and everything's good. But there's this opportunity in Minnesota. And I've been to Duluth. My husband's from Duluth, Minnesota, six feet of snow, 100 below wind chill when I first met him. Honey, I will never move here. Right? But this is where you get to go. Opportunity for this man, this gentleman. We're going to pay for your snow plowing. We're going to give you a maid. We're going to give you a, a new car and housing and a bonus. 
And for every month you stay, they're an extra five grand. Right? That isn't actually what the deal was. I tend to exaggerate, but it was pretty good, right? But he, family, love, money, status, he likes it right here. What does he do? He says, I'm taking that job because my family will love the money from my new status. <laughs> okay? So the point of that is, you know what they value. You can see it in maybe the messages that are sent out. You can see it in things that are presented within your organization. If you can key in on those things and get your project or your idea, whatever you want to talk to them about, key to that. You know, maybe you know what their legacy is. Maybe you know what they're struggling with. If you can do that, they will make time for you. That assumption will just be squished. We're going to squish that one right now, all right? These, some of you did not know these people you're sitting next to when you got here. And I gave you about two minutes, maybe. Look how many things you had in common. So those people you're not talking to, those executives you're not talking to, you're not having building relationships, interactions with. Why don't you, yeah, I like that. Give a prize to this man right here. He says, we're going to do the exercise with them. See what we have in common. That can be, hey, just go into one of those executives. Out. Hey, I, I just came from Margaret's workshop, and she told me that this is going to be the secret to our career success, so let's sit down and make a list of things we have in common. All right? Why not? Maybe you th because you don't think they're any fun. I went, you know that project I told you, Mission Impossible. We're going to do this thing next here in just a minute. Risk taking red light, green light. And I was going to have the executives play that game. Uh, oh, I better not do that. They're executives, right? They don't like to have fun. So I was talking with one of the executives later after my project got approved. Woo, <laughs> got the money. And I mentioned that to him, and he said, I would have done that. I would have done that. I like to have fun. You think they don't like to have fun. So there's a lot of things we don't know. And we're not doing things because we think they might not be fun. So the point of this is and nothing's going to change. You're going to be SOS instead of wow with your relationships unless you make a change. And that involves risk. So let's see what kind of risk takers you are. Oh, I thought that was you guys laughing. They were laughing for you. <laughs> They were like, oh, 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 the timing was perfect. Our, our, uh, it's a little narrow there, so I'm going to have you do it here. I need four people, volunteers. Oh, somebody just volunteered some. How many of you have ever played red light, green light? Come on up. I got room for four or five of you. Very, 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 back against the wall. His steps are too big. His steps. <laughs> Some of you have no idea what is going on because you missed out on part of your childhood. There's a game we played in Michigan called Red Light, Green Light. Maybe some of you played that, a sidewalk game we, when we played outdoors in the days you played outside without a phone. <laughs> and every, all your neighbors, your friends were at the other end, one end of the sidewalk, and you were it, and the goal is to be the first person to get to it. There is tape across there covering up cords. It's a safety hazard. Do not fall on that. So when I say green light, they move toward me. My back is to them. When I say red light, they have to stop. I turn around. If I see them moving, they go back to start. The first person that gets to me wins. All of you out there must be non-risk takers. These, <laughs> I want you to watch their behavior because the games we play uh, kind of give us a real feel for how we really are in life, maybe. Depends on the prizes. Two prizes for winning, one prize just for getting up, and you get two because you have two people in playing. <laughs> just tap me on the shoulder to win. You know, any questions? <laughs> Green light, red light. I like that pose. I want a picture. Someone take a picture. Are you taking a picture for me in the front row? Red light. Oh! I didn't see you though. I didn't see you though. Oh! She's a trickster. Green light. Red light. 
Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That was good. <laughs> it's tackle green light, red light. Where's my prizes? My bucket's somewhere. So two for the winner, one for... So there's different behaviors, right? Some of you didn't play for whatever reason. The prizes weren't big enough. She, or if she pulls out the gift cards and the $100 bill, then I will play, all right? So there's different reasons that you might not step out there, right? And then you played, and some of you played, and oh, she said red light twice in a row. What's up with that? Trickster, right? <laughs> But you were making an assumption I was going to go red light, green light, red light, green light. But now you know. And that's a creative risk taker. Pays attention, learns that information. Now that you know that about me, the next time we play, you're going to know you're going to be waiting. And you know, she turns around really slow. Some people say that. that I turn around really slow so they can keep moving. Right? But some, did anybody take baby steps? Ha, 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 baby steps. <laughs> But some people just like, no matter what I said, was there any of those? <laughs> All right. And that can be in real life. You've got people on your projects that take baby steps, and oh, they won't come along. Come on, we're going to do this. Come on, stop resisting. It's OK. I'll take the hit for it. Come on. Or are there are people that no matter what, they're running out there, and you're like, oh, come back here. They're ruining the project. Somebody help me, right? So you've got people that are addicted, but you also have those creative, which all of you are, intelligent risk takers. And that's why I do this exercise. I think it applies in a lot of different ways of what kind of risk taker are you? And how hard is it going to be to actually make this change? So maybe some of you want to like invite somebody out for coffee. And there'll be a little group of you. Maybe that's easier for you than doing it yourself. So I want you to think about, you already have your goal. You have your SOS to wow. Your wow is your goal. Evaluate different ways to do that. You don't, What's today? Tuesday. So some of you might be going back to work tomorrow, unless you told them the project management conference was three days long. <laughs> I'll see you Thursday. <laughs> OK? So you might go back to work tomorrow. You might call one of those people you've never talked to before and go, hey, I would love to share a couple of cool tips I got at the project management conference. Oh, there's a good lead in, right? Good set, right? Would you like to meet for coffee tomorrow? Some of you might be that kind of person. Others of you might need to get together with the group. Consider your risk taking your tendencies. Okay? Do you need to kind of get together with other people? Do you want to talk to that person directly? Do you want to talk to people that know them first and get to know them that way and then work your way through that? You can increase the risk ra uh, ratio by trying it, trying it out. You know, hey, here's what I want to say to somebody. How's that sound? Or, you know, start with some people you already know <laughs> a little bit, right? And just do it. Just take some action. So I encourage you to actually make that commitment to do that. So how motivated are you to actually do this and make some kind of change? Who's going to do something after? Well, all please raise your right hand. Thank you very much. Would you all please stand up? Now we got an easy crowd today. I can't get up to do anything. Oh, I know there's... Oh, it's so comfortable. Thank you very much. Sit down. <laughs> Why did you do that? You oh, because I asked you to. Because you trust me some certain level. We've developed a relationship. I said, please. See, different people have different reasons they'll listen to people. You've got to know that. i got to know that about you. But I also know that a lot of you are motivated by something else. Please look, stand up and look under your seat. Or you don't have to stand up. You could probably just bend over. Some of you do yoga, and you could bend over without standing up. If I told you I taped 10 scratch-off lottery tickets to seats in here on lunchtime break, would that get you out of your seat, looking under your seat, and that front row should have... I really did. There's 10. One, two, three, four, five. Sometimes the labels get ripped off of chairs, y'all. <laughs> If you're staying in, if you, if you're staying in here for the next workshop, maybe you want to look under your chair, because I don't know if we found all 10. But the point of that is you're motivated by different things. And when we started out, I brought up the why. And that why 
is probably going to motivate a lot of you to take some action. And the SOS is probably going to motivate some of you. And the WOW is going to motivate some of you. And the lottery tickets, like Colin, well, I told you, try something, email me in a month, I will send you a ticket. Oh, maybe a winning one. Okay? Do something. Take some action. All right? Okay. And I told you we wouldn't have time for the last part. We have five minutes. We have time for the last part. So less than ideal bosses. Don't have any. Are you one? So first I'll understand their incompetence because a lot of times just because we think that it's our perception, our perspective, there's a lot of things we don't know. So check and make sure that that's what's really going on. Talk to some other people, see if they also are having those issues. Is it just you? Because a lot of times we start, there this, but it's only around you, so maybe you're some kind of instigator. I don't know, right? If you ever have to talk to them about some issues on some things, about ways they're doing things, about that, right? Make it about you. Make it about the organization. Make it about the... But don't say, you know what? You're a real whatever, and here's what you need to fix. You know that's not going to come over very well. Sometimes you have to lead up. I was coaching a new manager whose manager wasn't really managing very well, and they had to actually manage around them and up but also save the face for their manager. And she was able to do that really well. So sometimes you actually have to step up, lead up. If you've ever seen other, you're not the project manager on a project, but you have to manage the project? Yes, okay. Rat them out. I do not recommend, but I've been very successful twice. So <laughs> there's a lot of politics in organizations, right? I mean, you do need to, you can work through HR. Again, assess what is the real issue. It is possible to get that person uh, to disappear, all right, <laughs> moved. <laughs> I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. <laughs> but it has to be done very carefully, and you really, that's kind of a last resort. And I have had managers that have just needed to go, and I've worked with HR to make sure that, they, it, that it, got, it happened. So it's possible, but it is not your first response. And the most thing is if you do have to stay, then you need to take care of yourself first. So. Take care of yourself. Eat some chocolate. Do yoga with Margaret at the beach or whatever. Just take care of yourself. Sometimes you have to leave. And I've left a job before because of that sign of thing. But if you want to talk any more about that, you're more than welcome to connect with me. Okay? So that's a lot of stuff. We busted some assumptions, right? You're going to take care of those assumptions. Thank you. You're going to look at one of those and do something different because of that.